My first memories are of a sharp knife swaying above my crib in lazy circles. My mother had hung it from my mobile so it would ward away any fairies with notions of swapping me for one of their changeling children. Maybe the fairies recognised the blade for a threat. Maybe one or two danced too close, and the blade tore at their wings, the iron that formed it searing their flesh, cutting and burning all at once. For whatever reason, I never considered the possibility that the knife could have fallen and ended my life before the fairies even had a chance to steal me. My mother was a woman who paid attention to detail. I trusted in the strength of the knots she tied. And despite everything, I never used to even contemplate the idea that any fairy could have gotten past my mother's safeguard. I'm me. I told myself right up until the last, even when my father, my husband, the priest, would try to convince me otherwise. But now, I find myself wondering. Surely it couldn't have been so hard for one swift little body to slip past my mother's knives. If I were a changeling, some wailing creature from under the ground, wouldn't I have known it? Even if my own mother had been deceived, wouldn't little changeling me have reveled at the bags under her eyes when she met my nighttime wails with tired arms and milk? Wouldn't I have tried to cause misery on purpose? But as far as I'm concerned, any misery I caused was accidental. And all I remember from babyhood is the glint of the blade swirling above in steady circles. Occasionally my mother's hand flicking it into movement again if it showed signs of slowing. Do changelings start to feel human? Is that what happened to me? I loved the house I lived in after I was married. I didn't live with Michael at the time. I loved the silence. Loved collecting the eggs every morning and feeling the warmth of the shells against my fingers. I saved enough to buy a machine. And then I loved using that to sew beautiful dresses. The needle flashing faster than even my mother's hand could have managed. I loved the pride that swelled in my chest when a customer held the garment up in admiration. <laughs> I can't say that I missed my husband. Should I have taken my easy ability to find such contentment in his absence as a sign that there was something wrong with me? Eventually, Michael was satisfied that we'd both saved enough money and we moved into that house. We got it for a steal because it was built a fair distance away from the village, inside a fairy ring. No one else would set foot inside the gate, let alone live there. Believe it or not, at that time I'd grown too used to contentment to believe in fairies souring the milk and stealing infants. But when we moved in, for the first time in my life it became hard to be happy. We had to take in Michael's father, Patrick. He was always ready to cut me down with some sharp comment or other. You're wasting your time at that machine. Do you really think anyone in this town has money to spare for such vanity? I didn't find it hard to ignore his barbs, tossing my head as if I was tossing away a fence and returning to my work. But they unsettled Michael. I wondered if Michael's mother had been cowed. Did she lower her head and hide her tears when her husband cut her down? If she'd allowed any hurt to show, I've no doubt she'd have been accused of seeking attention. Still, I adapted. It makes me wonder now if the human woman who should be in my place 
was taken to the realm of the fairies all those years ago as a babe. Has she also adjusted to her surroundings, becoming as clever and capricious as a fairy? I've not yet been ready to bear children myself, but in watching the families of my neighbours, I've observed that baby ears don't seem to grow much, if at all. This other me that Michael's so desperate to get back. Would her ears be slim and pointed by now? Like the knife that was meant to protect her? Surely one can't survive in a realm of predators by remaining squishy, soft prey. Michael started to agree with his father. I was being resentful, obstinate, sulky. Not myself. I heard their ponderous murmurs after I'd gone to bed. Even if they had succeeded in burning this me out, and winning back the human woman they are convinced was stolen, the one Michael was supposed to love and marry, my husband would surely come to know what temperamental is. No woman who'd run with the fairies this long would stand for such treatment. She'd poison Patrick shove Michael into some handy ravine and then burn the house down, reclaiming the fairy fort for her adopted people. I felt so weak at the end. Michael tried to force broth down my throat, while Patrick held me down and pressed on my nose so I had to open my mouth. He was always shockingly strong for a dying man, but I never swallowed. It always ended up spat on the ground, with the cats sniffing and licking. If I had the energy for it, I shooed the animal away as best I could. Who knew what they were putting in that food they were trying to give me? My last memories are of fire. When they held my body over the flames, I wasn't yet dead, just bruised, covered in their piss. A cure that was perfectly suited to Patrick's temperament. When I remember the heat melting my flesh away like so much candle wax, I start to hope that I am a changeling. I hope the real me comes back to claim her life, her place by Michael's side. She'll tell the police, No! See, I'm clearly not dead. My husband's a hero, and you must release him at once. Then she'll take him home to the house in the fairy fort. She'll remember the knife swaying above her head. And she'll know what it's really for. <laughs>